I chose this example because it is, uh, it, is it remains to be the biggest ivory seizure in the history of the world. <coughs> the ivory was from uh, poaching of elephants in Zambia. More than 700 elephants were killed for the, just that one shipment. <coughs> We found that the ivory was then taken to Malawi for packing. It was then taken yet to another country, uh, to Mozambique, um, and finally taken to South Africa, uh, being shipped from South Africa to Singapore on route to China. We found that there were several African-based companies involved uh, in Malawi. And we also found that a lot of these companies were again front companies and fake companies just so that the bill of lading could show different companies and uh, dissuade enforcement authorities. They were trading with companies based in China uh, and unfortunately we found that like the Singapore shipment there had been 19 similar shipments in the past few years and that had gone through without detection. Uh, another reason I chose this uh, example was because although this is the biggest ivory seizure ever to date, no key individual or corporate entity has been prosecuted, perhaps because of all of the challenges that we've just seen. Uh, another example that I'd like to talk about is how corporations are unable to carry out thorough due diligence of their investments, for example, and are unable to man maintain a, an effective chain of custody. And the example I've chosen here is EIA investigations in habitat destruction. This, was, this one is, was in 2003 when we <coughs> investigated illegal soapstone mining in Jamwa Rangar Wildlife Sanctuary in Rajasthan in India. We found that the prominent Indian company, the Golsha Group, was conducting illegal mining operations in a protected area completely prohibited by Indian laws as well as specific uh, Supreme Court decisions. We found that this was ha happening in tiger habitat, posing a serious threat to the survival of these species. And as you all may know, uh, there are fewer than 3,500 tigers left in the wild. So uh, something like this could uh, be the end for tigers. <coughs> when we did this, we knew that the reason they could operate so openly was because of collusion with the political powers that be. There was uh, rampant corruption in that state. And we also found that the group was marketing its products as sustainable and eco-friendly and no one was really questioning it at that point. What was interesting for us was we had this small but significant wildlife sanctuary in the middle of a desert state in India supplying products by destroying tiger habitat to these big MNCs, Johnson & Johnson, Unilever, Avon, Revlon, and Cousins. Uh, when EIA did its investigations and contacted these companies, they were oblivious to the illegality of the mining operations. Again, it's shocking because, um, the, because of the scale of the transnational operations, this is what is happening. Companies are unable to maintain an ongoing due diligence and audit of their investments. Similar findings were discovered by EIA uh, in an investigation we concluded recently last year in the Borneo island of Indonesia, where we found that large tracts of protected rainforests were being illegally converted to palm oil plantations. This was happening by destroying a habitat of endangered Borneo orangutans. We found that the palm oil companies themselves were Indonesian based, but they were obtaining significant fin financing from um, High Street Financial Institution, HSBC. Uh, what the, the problem EIA identified in this was that HSBC had and has no mechanism to identify when its investee companies are violating national laws or sustainability policies. They maintain that the policy they have is sufficient and they continue to rely on self-reporting by companies to show compliance with sustainability policies, which is again a, a big issue and failure on the part of investors on doing thorough due diligence and maintaining that due diligence and monitoring throughout the investment. Uh, the last example I have for you here is the exploitation of legal loopholes both in international law and national law by criminal syndicates. Uh, I've chosen here the example of CITES, the UN Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. Uh, this is a convention that at EIA we focus heavily on and we work under. CITES prohibits international commercial trade in CITES listed species such as, for example, rhinos. However, there are certain exemptions that the treaty contains for such prohibition. One such exemption is trade in hunting trophies. 
Now, this exemption for trade and hunting trophies exists because the assumption is that trade and hunting trophies is for personal use as opposed to commercial use and commercial trade. So, for example, what this means is that you could go hunting for rhinos in South Africa and then take the rhino horn trophy back to your home country for personal enjoyment, like say, mounting it on your wall, but you cannot sell it onwards for a huge pile of cash because that becomes under CITES uh, commercial trade and that is prohibited. However, this is what is happening exactly. Uh, right at this moment, this is what is happening. You've seen um, a network of criminals, individuals, and companies uh, involved in export, import, uh, tourism, and safari companies in South Africa and across the world who are doing just this. We're seeing legal rhino hunting taking place in South Africa. And the rhino horn trophy is exported as for, for personal use, and we've seen that this is happening to the Czech Republic. But what is happening later? is that it's then smuggled into Vietnam for commercial purposes where it's typically ground up and used in social drinks and toilets. That is a violation of CITES and that is a violation of EU laws as well as South African laws, but it's a huge loophole. It's international law allows this to happen. And how do you monitor something like this? You can't go back to the hunter's house and look at his wall, look for the trophy. It's impossible to actually uh, implement this. So we need to think about how to close legal loopholes for high-value species like rhino horn. Uh, I know I'm running out of time, so I won't spend too much time on recommendations, and uh, hopefully we could go through this, uh, the, the panel the discussion is open, but I just want to say that in terms of what is needed uh, for the government side, I would stress on application of money laundering laws. We need to see that happen as a priority, and we need to see closure of legal loopholes like the one I just mentioned. For the industry, we need to see uh, higher standards of operation and we need to see more due diligence and ongoing monitoring of the chain of custody. Um, that's it for me and I just wanted to say I also have uh, reports of EI if anyone's interested in <coughs> you can ask me for it. Thank you. Very much indeed. That was tremendously well informed uh, and gave some insights. Um, there are perhaps a dozen reasons why environmental law uh, isn't as well enforced as it should be, and most of them to do with complexity. Absolutely mind boggling some of those diagrams that um, you present us with. It's easy to see that the problems in enforcement there and your message, the law needs to catch up. I'm sure it's well, well made. So, um, from the international trade in, in wildlife uh, to somebody who is an expert in uh, prosecutions in more <coughs> homey areas, who's going to take us through anatomy of this, we're very pleased to have uh, Selesh Mehta here to, to talk about anatomy of a, a prosecution and perhaps uh, how enforcement can be made most effective. Thank you very much. The upset uh, apologies for the coughing and the heavy breathing. The pupil in chambers did some quick internet research into the symptoms and said there were two possible causes. One was the dust cloud from Sahara, which she informs me is going to get worse each year as the pollution in Africa increases. The other possibility, she said, dark loose Ebola. Um, <laughs> who gets the first? Anyone who this morning heard Tim Edwards' excellent speech about Bhopal and Union Carbide and the huge injustice that huge and powerful corporations can inflict against human victims and also the environment. Must have had their fists <coughs> clenched in rage about the lack of power that we, and particularly we prosecutors, seem to have against these large corporations. And so I thought that what might be uplifting, at least for me and possibly for you, is to slightly change my talk today to let you know that in fact the devil doesn't always have the best tunes, uh, that sometimes uh, David does beat 
Goliath. It's really my way of telling some anecdotes rather than going through 15 minutes of a, a difficult and turgid speech. Those of you who are film buffs may know of the film called The Untouchables, in which Sean Connery, who plays Jim Malone, a wise and grey-haired and embittered cop, is talking to the young, youthful and hopeful cop about how they can get Capone. How a person that cannot properly be prosecuted, despite all the best efforts of the state, and particularly the Chicago prosecutors, how do you get Capone? Said Sean Connery, you want to get Capone in his uh, Scottish American accent? Here's how you get him. He pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He sends one of yours to the hospital, you send one of his to the morgue. That's the Chicago way. That's how you get Capone. Can I translate that into lawyer speak? You want to get corporations? Here's how you get corporations. He pulls a Daily Telegraph article on you. You get a panorama program against him. <laughs> he sends one of his lawyers to the Crown Court. You send one of yours to the Court of Appeal. That's how you get corporations. That is the environmentalist way. And so uh, the next 10 or so minutes is going to be a, a series of anecdotes, really, about what it is that is required to prosecute. Because it's taken me about 25 years to become a just about half decent, acceptable prosecutor of these large corporations. Therefore, in 15 minutes, I don't think I can impart uh, enough information or what little knowledge I have other than uh, through these examples. Uh, and also, the talk would become a little technical a bit like the technical talk uh, I was giving to a High Court judge the other day about uh, the ins and outs of the European waste packaging regulations. And as his eyes were drooping at 3.30 in the afternoon, I asked, does my lord follow me? To which he said, I do, but I may need some assistance in finding my way back. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is it that you need we as prosecutors need to know about corporations. What is it that they fear most when you are thinking of prosecuting them? Well, the first thing they fear most is being prosecuted. Now, that may seem like an odd thing to say, but actually, the resistance against prosecution is huge. If I tell you that in the corridors of power right now in Parliament, in the Commons and the House of Lords, almost every major corporation has one of their people either helping an MP, pro bono of course, because there's nothing in it for the corporation, is there? Or helping to draft legislation. If I tell you, and the next speaker will be able to tell you in more detail, how corporations over the last 20 years have tried to decriminalize a lot of offenses to make sure that they, the corporations, don't get prosecuted then you get a, an idea of what you're against. And therefore, the way around it is to box clever, to make sure, certainly when I prosecute, to make sure that I've got a good team backing me, that I've got good politicians in, for example, the Fire Brigade or the Environment Agency or the Health and Safety Executive, who will make sure that when there is a phone call, the inevitable phone call from an MP or a Baroness, as there has been recently, that the team that I am leading in the prosecution have the gumption to stand up to the pressure. In one of the prosecutions that I started, and this was a series of prosecutions that lasted certainly over five years, in which we were trying to stop the export of our waste, in fact, Europe-wide waste, to developing countries. Waste such as plastics that might get burnt in China, but with rising cancer rates in the local villages where the plastic waste gets burnt. 
for electronic equipment that gets sent to the Alba market in Nigeria and then gets distributed all over Africa and where the parts, particularly the lead, then get burnt and cause all sorts of untold illnesses. When I was trying to prosecute in the first of the series of that prosecution, a phone call was received by those instructing me. It was from someone representing the Mayor of London, not the present Mayor, this was Ken Livingstone's representative. The phone call was to this effect. You are threatening to prosecute a major waste collection company that you are alleging is sending huge amounts of what is paper, but in fact, plastic masquerading as paper to China. We said unlawful. If you do that, we have been threatened that because this company collects most of London's waste, that company will stop all waste collections in the streets of London, and it will rot. Now, if there's one thing that Ken Livingston feared, one thing that would make him lose an election, it wasn't the rising cost of transport, it wasn't strikes, it was rotting waste on the streets of London. So you can imagine the huge amount of pressure to stop that prosecution dead in its tracks at that stage. This is what I mean about making sure that you've got the political backing. Because of course, luckily I did, and the Environment Agency said, do your worst. And we carried on the prosecution, and in the end there was a conviction. There are ways of also making sure that what resources you have, you use to the maximum effect. About 10 years ago, I was sent some papers my junior and I decided that we would prosecute for an environmental offence, but this time we would prosecute for a conspiracy to commit an environmental offence. Shock horror. No prosecutor had ever prosecuted a corporation as being part of a conspiracy to commit an environmental offence. <coughs> had to do a lot of persuasion by own team to allow that to happen. There was outrage on the defence side. There were applications uh, to the Crown Court judge to have the prosecution stopped as an abusive process. It didn't work. And of course, eventually it turned into a guilty plea. And so you've got to think a little more widely, uh, think a little more robustly than you might otherwise if you're prosecuting any other area of law. So they hate being prosecuted. But they also hate publicity. They will sometimes try to use the publicity to their own advantage long before you, the prosecutor, can use it. Recently you may have heard of a fanfare by a phone company, a household name, who I'm prosecuting. On the very day that they were due to appear in court for the first time, there was a news article, to my surprise, as I was having breakfast, I saw it. Thousand jobs created by this fantastic company. Uh, local politicians paraded before the BBC cameras, saying how grateful they were that this wonderful company, who was in fact causing all manner of havoc elsewhere, was in their patch creating much needed employment. So they will try to get there first in terms of publicity. When I came out of the High Court a few years ago, arms raised in victory, or so I thought, having saved future generations, in my own mind, uh, from uh, the evils of uh, waste plastic, from flower pots being dumped into the ground. We, we were appealing uh, a, a case that we'd lost in the magistrate's court, uh, which required, you know, we won in the high court, which then required every producer of plant pots, and believe me, there are millions of plant pots produced all over Europe, uh, to force them uh, to recycle these bits of plastic rather than burying them underground. So came out of the High Court, arms raised, full of victory, and thinking at least a passing, passing youngster would thank me for saving his generation. The next day, every single major newspaper, we're talking about the Times, Guardian, Telegraph, etc., front page news, critical of the case that I thought I'd magnificently won. And the reason for it was it was all part of Europe gone mad. That was the story. Not that Meta brilliantly saved future generations from plastic <laughs> pots, <laughs> much to my annoyance. It was, this is European legislation gone mad. How can plastic plant pots that you take home and then take the plant out, put in your garden, and leave the plant pot in your shed 
for 10 years and it disappears. How can uh, the court require those pots to be recycled? As it happens, if you aggregate the weight of those plastic pots, it turns into hundreds of thousands of tons a year. Uh, the Sun newspaper, to my great annoyance, on page 7, uh, criticised the crack expensive London team of lawyers that have been wasted, or uh, that the money wasted on them by the Environment Agency to bring this case. And my son unhelpfully said it's a typo, it should have been crap. <laughs> <laughs> so they will try to pull the knife, the publicity knife on you, but you can pull the publicity gun on them. One way you can do that, and a number of prosecuting bodies are already doing it, is you become media savvy. So I alluded to the Panoro Panorama program. There have been a series of programs, particularly relating to the cases I've been prosecuting over the last five years, about our waste going abroad. Piles of waste seen in India, in cities in India, uh, with little kids, street kids, uh, sifting through the waste and then burning the rest. Piles of waste in Ghana, electronic waste, being burnt so that they can take out uh, the copper and the huge environmental and personal uh, human harm that that does. And the advantage of all of that is that it gets the jury, the public on your side, apart from educating the public as well. Because when I open a case in front of a jury, as I'm going to be doing soon, you can imagine the look on the jury's face. They come to the old daily, as I was for one of my cases involving Brazil recently, and they're hoping for a decent murder at the very least. <laughs> uh, and if not, they'll settle for a bit of a pub fight. And here's a prosecutor talking about environmental pollution. So you've got to make sure, firstly, that you've got the public on your side with this sort of information. You've then got to make sure, as a prosecutor, that you make the, the, the facts, you, you make your opening speech accessible to the jury. I was prosecuting a major water company. And what they'd done is unlawfully opened up all the sluice gates and allowed millions of tons of untreated effluent straight into the nearby river. Um, and of course all the fish died and caused harm that would take 10 years to undo. The ace card the defence had, and it was an obvious ace card, was that this was going to be so difficult for me, the prosecutor, to explain to a jury in Aylesbury Crown Court as to how the piping system and the sluice system and how this transit, that this capacitor failed and that pump therefore didn't do its job and how it all interacted into causing this mass evacuation of effluent. And they knew that, and they were sniggering before I even got to my feet. And I had these wonderful and complex charts in front of me. Luckily, at the weekend, I'd managed to do some colour charts with a thick felt-tip crayon. And my son, who was then seven, assisted me. And I said to the jury, sorry about the funny colouring, but my seven-year-old helped me colour this, just to make it easier for you. <laughs> and suddenly, no juror thought this was a complex case at all. In fact, at the end of my opening speech, and this has never happened to me before, because even though I'm known as a booty prosecutor, I'm not known as an unfair one, um, the defence solicitor, who was sitting next to the jury, came running up to me, we had a short break after my opening, and said, we've just seen a note that one juror passed to another juror at the end of your opening. And the note said, why are we even here? Are they guilty or very guilty? <laughs> <laughs> I tried to persuade defence counsel to raise it with a very crusty judge called Rodwell, who's come out of retirement. Um, he was frightened because he thought that uh, I would, uh, my response would be, why on earth was the defence team sitting so close uh, to the jury to be able to read their note? And therefore I, as a prosecutor, was forced to raise that point with the judge who brushed aside saying, no, I'm sure when the facts uh, come before the jury in evidence, they can forget all of that. Uh, in fact, they, they convicted within 10 minutes of retirement. <laughs> <laughs> so publicity, they do not like, especially if it's good publicity. At the end of the case, what I try to ensure is that we have a press pack available. Now, this is something that most prosecutors, certainly my pupil master's generation, 
uh, would frown at? How on earth can a barrister from such a, a traditional and crusty profession even think about journalists without spitting on the ground? Um, how can we even try anything to assist the journalist? Well, actually, you should have a press pack ready. You should have pictures. You should have photographs. So when we prosecuted a company that dumped hundreds of thousands of tons of steaming waste on Europe's biggest swan sanctuary, we had the press pack ready. And that evening on Sky News, to Tchaikovsky's music, the camera panned this beautiful lake uh, with a white swan swimming across, and then it panned to the steaming mass of waste as the music darkened. Now that has far more effect than a grey-haired prosecutor does in getting a conviction in court. And that's why a press pack is essential at the end of a prosecution. But sometimes, more often I find, prosecuting bodies are also preparing a short press pack at the very start of the prosecution to get there before the defence get to the right or the wrong journalist. Make sure that you get the publicity right. When I was at the Old Bailey on one of the environmental cases, and few environmental cases get to the Bailey, normally they're shifted out to Blackfriars uh, or to Southwark because uh, uh, the Old Bailey judges don't want something uh, as easy as an environmental case. Um, the judge that I had uh, was very difficult at the start of the case. Uh, he wondered out loud why it is that a case such as this it should be in his court, the subtext being he's too important a judge for a case of this relative unimportance, until I mentioned to him that in fact the waste that we were prosecuting that had been sent from this country to Brazil had resulted in an international diplomatic incident in which the Prime Minister of Brazil had complained that Britain was acting like a colonialist uh, empire in sending its waste to his country. That's when the judge suddenly stopped, sat up <coughs> and paid attention. And that was again reported on the front pages of a number of newspapers. So publicity is key to these things. So they hate being prosecuted, they hate publicity, they hate their directors <laughs> being prosecuted or being brought into the fray. The smaller the company, the easier it is to get a director in. And the standard policy that I tend to employ as a prosecutor is, why shouldn't I be able to bring the director in? If there is enough evidence, and usually there is, if there's enough against the company, there should be, particularly for a small company, easily enough against a director. They don't like that because they can hide behind the corporate veil, but as soon as you attack one of their own, their directing mind, then you've had it. And so directors, much more difficult with companies at the size of Union Carbide or others to get their director, but there are ways of doing it. If you don't prosecute, or even if you prosecute the company, have your eye on the director that you really want. Make sure you as a prosecutor write to the company saying this is the offence we want one of your directors to come to be interviewed. And we want a director that's responsible for this area, whether it's the water pollution or the land pollution. Someone who knows what they're talking about. So instantly you've identified him or her. And then you write a letter saying, we think this may be happening again. Please tell us which director of yours has been put in charge. And if they won't tell you, then you use that against them in the prosecution and you tell the judge. They won't even appoint a director to stop this happening in the future. So you can start preparing for your next prosecution by slowly drawing out the right person to prosecute, the right director, in the future. And in the one minute that I have left, the fourth area is their money. They don't like their money being taken away from them. They can live with the bad publicity. They can just about get acclimatized to the prosecution and one of their minion directors being prosecuted. They don't want their money taken away. And so you can prepare for that the way we have. You can approach the Sensing Guidelines Council and educate them about how piffling the fines are and how they should be increased. You can make sure at the start of your prosecution you start looking at their bank accounts, 
before they start frittering them away. You start looking at the web of companies that are part of the main one. You start isolating the big company rather than the little ones that they put forward as the, uh, the, the potential defenders. That way, you maximize their, the fine that you get, and also you then chase them under the process of crime act afterwards for the offense that they've committed and the benefit that they've got from their offense. So you then attack them with the money. So there are ways of getting out of the home, and those are the four ways. Thanks very much uh, indeed, that was uh, entertaining, interesting, insightful, contained a lot of stuff that you just wouldn't get from reading the law reports uh, on these cases. <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, the speakers in these sessions are getting 20 minutes, and I'm um, uh, giving them about, uh, give them about uh, 20 seconds to introduce them, but in this case I feel it could be the other way around. Because Richard McCrory has done so much stuff that um, what do you say in, in 20 seconds? Um, the, from an academic point of view, uh, we are, um, as those of you that are in universities will appreciate, assessed uh, nationally according to the impact of our research. There's nobody I can think of in academic environmental law whose work has had a greater impact. I'm going to leave it at, at, at that. much um, and once again congratulations to the students who organized all this I know they do all the hard work and I know in the last two or three weeks you might think it's all going it is going very well at the moment it's been absolute nightmare for some of them uh, so congratulations um, I also want to uh, if you like be a little bit parochial and talk about an experiment in sanctioning and approaches to dealing with companies which is taking place in this country in the last two years and I think the questions maybe will come up for discussion is one, you know, is this the right way to be going, but can it translate into other areas or the sort of international areas that we've, um, we've talked about? And so I start with a, um, it's a very simple thing that all of you studying environmental law will know that there are a mass of different types of instruments that we can be using and we do use in the environment from, if you like, the kind of softest where we try to go for voluntary arrangements with companies or whatever to do it under their own, the sort of reputational thing we hear this morning, right to the end at the bottom where we formally ban a whole process or a product. My point here really is that once you get into the kind of area of red from fiscal taxation onwards, these are not really voluntary things that are happening. Uh, they have some form of regulation and you have to have some form of sanction to deal with it, to deal with the companies and corporations who are trying to cheat, obviously on taxation, even emissions trading. If companies don't register by the end of the day, it may be an economic instrument we're using, but you have to have fun, some sort of punishment or sanction taking place. So that's the first general thing. And often, certainly in, and I think we haven't got any government lawyers here, um, often when government lawyers are drafting legislation, they get very focused on the types of policies that they're using, all those complexes, and the sanction clauses all get rather left to the end. And they just say, oh yeah, we've got to have some sanctions put in the standard model. The second thing, and um, you'll know this very well from, from um, prosecuting, the range of circumstances in which a regulatory breach can take place is very varied from the sorts of things we've been hearing a lot of today, which I assume are absolutely intentional, or at the most are reckless, to where you get completely unexpected, equipment breaks down. The problem is that then you overlay another matrix on those and you can get, for instance, an unexpected equipment breakdown, which actually has a serious consequence or a serious breach, actually causes real pollution, might even harm somebody. Um, other cases, you can get cases where you have a, um, a fairly careless breakdown, but actually no profit is made by this, no money is saved by this, or it's the first time. And so those who are enforcing the law have to bring all this to um, bear. I was asked uh, four years ago, eight years ago now, sorry, not four years ago, time passes, 
um, by the Cabinet Office to look at our regulatory sanctions. I wasn't concerned, and we can have a whole other conference about that range of instruments, what is suitable for what sort, sorts of areas. Uh, not doing that, just simply saying, well, when things go wrong, what sort of regulatory sanctions do we do? And you can see it had to go well beyond environmental law. I was dealing with health and safety, food standards, local authorities, uh, a whole area is completely outside my competence, but still <coughs> one does it. Um, and produced the report, and the then government accepted all the recommendations which were in legislation and beginning to roll out. One of the things that came out from that is some principles. What should underline the sanctions? When we think about designing the law, what should we do? And I came up with two core principles and some other ones, but it seemed to me that. And, you know, you might think, well, this is just common sense. It just hadn't been written down before, and this is not completely out of my head. I was looking at the literature, pulling it together. Was that the main purpose of a sanction is to change the behavior of the business and bring them back into compliance. Sometimes you need to process them through the criminal law, the real stigmatizing. You need to jail the directors, as you thought, to change that behavior. But my concern was, is that always the case? Are there cases where we don't have to use the criminal law? Secondly, it seems to me that we're in areas here where non-compliance with regulation, whether it's intentional or whether it's unintentional or careless, is going to make money. It saves money for the company. And therefore, at the very least, a sanction should ensure that there is no financial gain made. And certainly, in talking to the compliant companies who I did, they said the thing that really annoyed them was when they are investing money to comply with regulation, and they're aware that there are companies down the road who are undercutting them and non-cutting them. And then when, as you say, sometimes they get to the magistrate's court, the fine doesn't seem to quite match the profits made. And when I looked at the UK sanction system, there was a very heavy reliance on criminal sanctions, practically in every area of the law. At the end of the day, when there was a formal sanction, the, uh, the, the, it was a criminal offence. And most of them drafted in strict liability terms, a concept which most German lawyers don't understand at all. They say, well, crime must involve intention. 19th century, we invented the strict liability offence, so you don't necessarily have to prove intention or recklessness. That will go to the sentence, not proving the guilt. So it's a pretty tough system in legal concerns, and we could, we could talk about that, whether it's right to use the criminal law in that sense, and there is, a, if those who read the academic literature, there is a lot of dispute amongst academics and others whether that is appropriate for crime to have non-intentional offences, does it make this, but let's get into that now. How do you attempt with that? Well, you do two things. One is that no regulator, or even the police, they don't have to prosecute, even if they have 100% evidence of crime. They have an enforcement discretion to make a judgment should they prosecute or not. And they often will use, instead of prosecuting, they will use cautions or warnings and so on. And that's a judgment they're making that we don't need to take this offender to court to achieve the aims. Um, secondly, and of course, the courts will also have a strong sentencing practice where they uh, will try, and this is the evidence of the prosecutor and the defense counsel, try and judge what end of the scale are we on. Um, there's still a criminal offence. But really my concern was that we're making the criminal law do an awful lot of work in this area. And I should say that in every area of regulation I looked at, from food standards, health and safety, to waste or whatever, at one end of the scale there are real criminals operating. I mean serious criminals who understand the law, they know how to work the system, and they are consciously making money out of it. The sort of cases you were describing in wildlife. At the other end of the scale, there are companies who make mistakes, careless at the most, but still have consequences. And the question was, is that useful for the criminal law to be in there? One of the problems of overusing the criminal law, as I said, I, I, I completely support its use for certain areas. But it can be a very disparate, it's a heavy-handed response. And, and it is quite right, as I put there, and you all know this, sir, undertaking a prosecution is a serious business. It's time consuming, it takes a lot of energy, because the consequences for either the individual or the company can be very serious indeed. So it's quite right that. But also fines themselves, just imposing a fine, even a serious fine, may not be the best way of changing, changing the behavior of the company. 
And one of the worries, it's always very difficult, and I have to say, I was on the board of the Environment Agency for a time, so I've got a sense of that. If you over-rely on prosecution as your main uh, weapon, is you can then get what's called a compliance deficit, where there are simply a whole lot of areas you should be imposing a sanction, but you don't. You haven't got the time or the resources, or you don't judge it to be the right response. Um, we don't have specialist criminal courts dealing with the environment. And lastly, which did concern me more and more as I looked into it, is that if we overuse the criminal law for every area of this activity, we actually devalue the impact of the criminal law itself. I mean, I want the fly tippers, the intentional polluters, the intentional companies, and they to be treated like burglars or rapists or something like that. I think that's there is bad. But by putting everybody into the same box, there is a danger then you get, and you will see it all the time, clever defence barristers, and indeed sometimes judges say, well, this is a mere technical offence. This is not a real offence. This is not real crime. Well, I think it should be. So, what did I recommend? Well, not very... Um, uh, oh, yes, no. Uh, this turns out to be a rather personal um, case. In the middle of this, my report, there was a case involving Porsche UK, which actually epitomised to me what was wrong with using the criminal law. And um, I have to say, we haven't met for eight years. I was warned by this by the cabinet office, and I went to watch it. And this was the packaging regulations, which I'm sure you all know dearly, where um, companies over a certain size producing a certain amount of packaging, it's kind of supermarket size, it's not small shop, supermarket size, have to register with the agency and then commit themselves <coughs> to recycling a certain amount. So it's a recycling law. Um, we introduced in the law, the only sanction we had, if you don't register, was to make it a criminal offence. And the agency, after a little bit of time, said, um, if people don't register, we will prosecute every single case. We have to, because you're getting out of the system, you've made money, but it's unfair in all the companies who do register. Porsche UK, um, as you find, they hadn't registered. I think it was about five years. Now, I have to, I have to reveal something. This prosecutor on this side um, occasionally defends companies. <laughs> and it turned out, who was the defender for Porsche? They were very eloquent. They actually, you almost convinced me. Now, you're not going to get embarrassed at all. But anyway, um, Porsche UK found that they had failed to register. It seems, so we don't get into the detail, I mean, that, that you know, it wasn't intentional. Actually, the German head office had advised them, oh, well, you don't, I think they'd said, well, we've registered there in Germany, you don't have to, you're a subsidiary, you don't have to register separately. It was that sort of thing. So it was a kind of, careless cock-up, but no more. They went so far as to own up and say, look, we've made about over three, about 22,000 pounds. We didn't register, there's a fee, we didn't recycle. Um, and I think initially they said, well, to the agencies, can we give the money to somebody? Because we don't want to have made a profit out of it. Of course we're going to register in the future. And the agency said, well, there's no way in English law, we can't do that, we're going to prosecute you. So it ended up in front of Reading Magistrates Court, you will remember well, uh, this man actually said this is a mere technical offence, I remember that, I quoted it. Um, but he said we have to plead guilty because we, it's a strict liability offence. I like my wife. Um, so, uh, uh, and we have, but we have saved this amount of money. And I remember you standing up to the court saying, and we'd like to give this to a charity or something, but we realise the court hasn't got these powers. The magistrates, I have to say, which did, I, I thought, what? This, this is not a good use of criminal time. Three lay magistrates. The first thing they said was, I think we've got to go and read the regulations. And they went for a coffee break. I can't understand the regulations. I don't they anyway, they came back. Eventually what they did, they fined just about a maximum on every charge. It was very unclear whether they were giving Porsche a serious slap on the wrist or saying, you've made the money, that's what we're doing. Um, so it, it, it seemed to be a very unsatisfactory way of using the criminal law. So what I basically, and that was, that was a, um, thank you for watching that, it was a good case, <laughs> is that to suggest that regulators, in addition to criminal, don't get rid of the criminal offences, this is not actually decriminalising, it's giving them another option for certain cases. They should be able to impose civil sanctions without going through the criminal courts. It's the same offence, they still have to prove if it gets challenged, they have to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And it's the regulator who decides. It's not the company who says, I want to go to civil sanction. The regulator makes, a, 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 if you like, a professional decision, because they're doing that all the time when they decide to prosecute or not. This is actually, we don't need to send this to criminal courts. We can actually deal with this in a way not through the court system. And if the offender doesn't appeal against the sanction, they can just pay that sanction and they don't have to do it. So this is suitable for the company 
who is prepared to plead guilty, own up, and they want to move on. But we added the rider, and this is really what I want to talk about in the last sort of six minutes or so. That's all right. Um, four minutes. Four minutes, okay. A further option on this, rather than to have to react to a sanction imposed by the agency, why don't we give the offender the chance to offer their own sanction, to say, yes, we're guilty, and this is what we're going to do to deal with the situation. And, if necessary, and often will do, it will include the paying of money, because we shouldn't have made money out of this. If it works, and, it, and you've got to have a system, which we have in the law, where it's the regulator who decides whether or not to accept this sanction, so gain their professional judgment. Is, is this just a company trying to get out of it, or is it going to have a serious effect? And I'm prepared to give that um, judgment to the regulator. Is If you design your own sanction, then it's more embedded in your system. You own the sanction, if you like. So the undertaking can include uh, commitments to restore, payments to third parties such as charities to account for the profit, any profits made or whatever, and commitments to internal action. Now this has been going on for about two years. The environment agents at the moment have been given this in a very narrow set of regulations. The government, as I've mentioned in the moment, won't yet, they're, they're a bit sort of worried about it. So it's basically in the area of packaging, some oil pollution, some water pollution. And the First of all, is it an easy option for offender? Well, at the moment, the agency has a policy. is If they can see what the costs were saved, even if it was completely inadvertent, they will add about a third onto that. So you can't make money. And you can't, well, you, well they didn't want a situation where you know, a company says, well, let's not comply. And then if we get found out, we'll offer an undertaking to make up the costs. So there's always, there is a punitive element in this. Um, secondly, what about the, uh, and the regulator has to say, has the discretion to say, that they could always criminally prosecute at the beginning. So they're, 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 you can't get out of that. What about the regulator who decides, I can't be bothered to prosecute, or they're avoiding this, going for a simple option? Well, first of all, that's where the accountability, that could happen. But there is an enforcement policy by the regulator. It has to be published. So they have to say, in these sorts of stuff, you know, a repeat offender with serious consequences, they say, we will, we will nearly always prosecute. So if it turns out that this isn't happening very, very much, the security undertakings, one would hope that Friends of the Earth or whatever would start saying, what the hell is going on? What are you doing? And also, very important, and I insisted on that in the legislation, that any undertaking has to be published. It has to be available. You can look it up on the website now to have some sort of accountability. And here we have the last um, four months where we have 23 examples, such as mostly packaging, three pollution, what is interesting is in over 50% over of those examples, the company actually owned up to the offence, which is actually quite significant because they're quite difficult to find it. They owned up. Now, obviously, for any defence or solicitors, you know, it's a gamble. You find out you've committed an offence on the packaging. Do you ring up the agency and say, can we do an undertaking? The agency might just say, sorry, we're going to prosecute because they've still got that option. So you've got to make a judgment on that, quite difficult. But at the moment, in, in the last, I'm just counting it up, um, over £1 million has been given to environmental charities um, under that. And to give you a game, to push it there, here are three examples on our stories. Now, what's interesting is that this isn't just paying money to charities. There is a commitment to take action to get back into compliance. And here, I've just summarised it. These are all men. Oil storage, this company called Tuagra, have put in new pipes in a tank they've committed, plus remediation plus some money to the Norfolk Wildlife Trust. Packaging regulations, <coughs> register, have a better internal reporting scheme to make sure it doesn't happen again, plus really quite a large sum of money to a wildlife trust. And then this is one for you for that. River pollution, relocate story storage, <coughs> and 10, I think it's 10,000 pounds to that. Um, so there's quite a lot of, and I actually think if this is working well, if it's a sensible system, there's only one person who's losing out on this, <laughs> no, no, no. Well, maybe. Uh, yes, that's a good one. That's a, it's the Treasury, because the Treasury normally receive all fines and all civil sanctions would go to.